is uh, my my uh, son's friend saying with us. Uh, this morning I tried to to wake both of them up, but the girl didn't wake up. We tried to wake her up. I don't know what it is. I need you to pull back the duvet for me and just look to see if you can see any signs of breathing. Uh, um, I tried to hold the pulse. No, I need you to put your put your put your face next to her mouth. Can you feel any breath? Can you see her chest going up and down? No. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Emily and all those affected by this dark case. Emily Longley was born on the 15th of July 1993 in England. She was born to Caroline and John Longley. However, Emily grew up in Auckland after the family moved to New Zealand when she was just 10 years old. But in 2010, Emily seemed to fall in with what was described as the wrong crowd. Everyone decided it was best that she return to the UK to finish her studies. So that is exactly what she did. She then lived with her paternal grandparents, Ronald and Zosha Longley. So upon her return to the UK, she lived in Southbourne near Bournemouth. She was an aspiring model with big ambitions and even signed to a local modelling agency. Now getting back to being a focused teenager, Emily took a course in business studies at Brockenhurst College in Hampshire. As well as this, she also worked part-time at the clothing chain Topshop. Emily was described as an outgoing, intelligent and vibrant young woman. She was very, very loved by a lot of people. Bournemouth boasts seven glorious miles of pretty idyllic coastline. This makes it a pretty popular holiday destination in the UK. For many, it's a place to create lasting memories. Its seaside resorts come alive fully in the summer sun. Hopefully, this is the UK. But the sun isn't always needed to enjoy the lovely beaches, cafes and walks that the area has to offer. A weird fact about Bournemouth is that the Beatles loved the place and they played there regularly in their early career. Sadly though, just like any other town, lurking amongst its upstanding citizens are dark characters that cannot be illuminated by even the sunniest of days. Emily met a man named Elliot Turner in December of 2010. She was 17 and he was 20 years old. Elliot was a well-known figure in the local bar and club scenes in the Poole and Bournemouth areas. He was a member of something called The Firm. They were a gang of young men who mainly just had daddy money and no responsibility. But I'm not bitter. He was the son of a millionaire after all, so it was only befitting. His father, Lee Turner, was a jeweller, and he had made a fortune for himself from the work. Elliot's friends knew him as All Talk Turner, so I think we are building a pretty strong picture of the kind of man that Elliot was. Elliot Turner could not stop bragging. When he was with his friends, he boasted a lot, almost constantly. Shortly after meeting, Emily and Elliot seemed to get along very well. They both went on a double date after Emily returned to England on her quest to better herself and become a successful young adult. However, the relationship was turbulent and on-off. They enjoyed the high life together and often stayed out late into the night and the early hours. They would be partying, drinking and living their version of glitz and glamour. However, Elliot was historically obsessed with women. He was jealous and he couldn't hide it. It was said that Elliot could be threatening, aggressive, violent, controlling and possessive towards Emily. All of these things were not the making of a gentleman, no matter how big their trust fund. Just a few months into their relationship, Emily wrote Elliot a letter of sorts. Its contents were somewhat concerning. On a piece of paper, Emily wrote a short list. Number one, I love you. 
Number two. Number two. Don't say you'll kill me. Number three. Stop talking about your ex-girlfriends. Number four. Stop being so constantly aggressive. Be more cool because that is so much hotter. And you make me scared because you're so intimidating. Now the dark picture of this relationship was being brought into sharper focus. Emily was frustrated, hurt and scared. However, the relationship did not break up, but instead broke down in the worst way imaginable. At the start of May, Emily had gone on Facebook to state that she had a stalker. Emily also posted, someone just called me and I was like, who's this? And they were like, you don't know me, but I know everything about you. And I was like, how did you get my number? And he was like, I'll tell you when I see you and kept asking me out. So I hung up and I won't stop calling. I'm really scared. It's a private number as well. Some people just need to get a life. On Thursday the 4th of May, Emily posted that she was down and out. Meanwhile, Emily had sent a text message to her mother about Elliot's controlling behaviour. She now confessed that she had considered breaking up with him. The message read, I'm thinking of breaking up from Elliot because of his controlling, threatening behaviour. This is pretty damning and pretty scary. It is hard to imagine how Mother Caroline must have felt on the other side of the world, knowing her daughter was scared and quite possibly in danger. On the night of May the 6th, throughout the night, CCTV footage shows that the couple are not very close. Earlier on in the day, Elliot attacked into Emily's social media. Whilst prying in her private life, he discovered a message from another man. A man that was offering to buy Emily a drink if he saw her out that night. Elliot was enraged by this message. Over the course of a night in one of the bars, Elliot saw the man from Emily's DMs. And from somewhere, he obtained a lump hammer. And then he threatened the man with it. He warned him off of Emily and threatened to take his life if he didn't comply. Things between Emily and Elliot were not going well at all and at some point in the night, Emily threw a drink over Elliot and we can imagine how this went down. The distance between the couple is increasingly obvious as they move from club to club. Emily and Elliot had an argument over her outfit choice. It didn't end well as Emily, against her will, agreed to go back to Elliot's house in the Queen's Park area to talk things over. Emily was back at Elliot's house. A conversation took place, but we will never know its true contents. All we know is that it happened in Elliot's room, and it would be Emily's last. Just tell me what's happened there, no reason for the call. My, my uh, son's friend is playing with us. Uh, this morning, I tried to, to wake both of them up, but the girl didn't wake up. We tried to wake her up, I don't know what it is. Right, now, is she breathing? No, I don't think so. Right, how old is she? She is, um, 17. I need you to pull back the duvet from it and just look to see if you can see any signs of breathing. Uh, um, I tried to hold the pulse. No, I need you to put your, put your, put your face next to her mouth. Can you feel any breath? Can you see her chest going up and down? No. Nothing. What colour is he? Um, what colour is he? Yeah, what colour is he? Is he blue? Is he, is he red? Is he red? Look, my, uh, my husband is having a look now. Hang on. Got anything round her neck? Anything around her neck? Oh, ooh, that necklace. No, she's got a necklace very tight. Very tight round her neck? Yeah. Can you, can you unget that necklace off? Okay. How tight? Very, very tight. Uh, the ambulance is here. Uh, I need you to open the front door and get that necklace from around her neck off. Oh, okay. Now, do it now. Emily's body was found on the morning of May the 7th, 2011. When police attended the scene, Anita Turner, the 51-year-old mother of Elliot, said that Emily had died in her sleep whilst at her house. An inquest was opened into her death and later adjourned by the Bournemouth Pool and East Dorset coroner. The cause of death at that point was undetermined and subject to toxicology tests. Two men from Bournemouth, aged 19 and 17 respectively, were arrested concerning the passing of Emily. However, they were released on police bail pending further inquiries. Emily's father believed that his daughter had probably died in her sleep. 
but the cause of her death at this time remained a mystery. He claimed it was a huge shock to both parents and they were surely going to take a trip from New Zealand to England on a quest to discover what had happened to their beloved Emily. She was a beautiful girl and full of life. It's so tragic, Father John told the New Zealand Herald. With the text messages sent to Emily's mother and her strange Facebook status updates, exactly what had happened couldn't quite be pieced together, but suspicions were growing. Anita Turner's claims that Emily had simply passed away in her son's bed only made the police officers more suspicious. They then made their decision to bug the household. Now they simply awaited the family to slip up and share more than they would do openly. Obviously unaware of the surveillance the police had put in place, the couple unwittingly gave the evidence that police needed to confirm what they already suspected. They played straight into the hands of the law. Elliot's father Lee, as we know, is a jeweller, and his mother Anita was a healthcare assistant. Anita used bleach to destroy a confession note that her boy had written after he killed Emily. Elliot confessed to his mother what he had done to Emily, whilst held up in their £350,000 mini mansion. The police bug recorded the parents' conversations after they destroyed the note. This is the real audio from that house. I'll warn you, it's pretty crazy to listen to. We were right to destroy them. Huh? Yeah, we were right to destroy them. Yeah. Because we were right to destroy them. Because we were right the course of justice. We have destroyed vital evidence in this case. We were right. Yeah. Yeah, Mum, but I focused the conversation because it looks... You look so guilty, you look so guilty by ringing the father. No, I didn't. But, yeah, but mom, mom, please, from a policeman's point of view, it's so, so obvious. She, that, that girl is, well, I've been that that girl has ruined my life. Yeah. She has ruined my life. Yeah. Did she ruin your life? I would have known she was freezing, she was freezing, mum. You can't be, you gotta think, 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 think. Brain, brain, brain. Just thought she was, you know. I don't know, I just thought she was, I thought she was just knackered. Just really tired, as this happened before when I can't get her out of bed. Hence, hence officer, I made a cup of tea. First, because I thought, I thought she was okay. Mum, that's fine, it's, it's so believable. It's burning me inside. Every second of my day it's burning. But I know something that they don't know. It's burning me, eating me up. I just get grabbed out and I grabbed it as hard as I could in my life. The police had what they needed to take the case to the Crown Prosecution Service and Elliot, Lee and Anita were all arrested surrounding the death of Emily Longley. In April of 2012, almost a year after Emily met her untimely end, Elliot's trial began. Elliot Turner informed the jury that he had a short and fiery relationship with Emily. The prosecution said that Emily Longley was killed in a jealous rage, all whilst in the Turner's family home. They added that Turner had a history of obsession with women and believed that Emily was seeing someone else other than him. His parents helped him cover the crime. They helped him destroy his confession letter. This was a vital piece of evidence in the case to bring justice to Emily and Emily's family and they took that away. The jury has heard how Elliot Turner was aggressive, controlling and manipulative towards Emily. It was Elliot Turner's jealousy and anger that led him to kill Emily. It has been our case throughout that Elliot Turner has failed at any stage to show remorse and that he knew exactly what he was doing. When he was cross-examined, Elliot said he only defended himself when Emily attacked him. He said it was an argument in his bedroom that turned violent. He said that he grabbed the deceased by the neck for five to six seconds. He then pressed down on Emily as she lay on the bed to stop her from attacking him. He said when he woke the next morning, he found Emily's lifeless body in the bed beside him. However, it was revealed through the trial that Elliot had strangled Emily as he was overtaken with jealous rage. He left her dead body in his bed at Queenswood Avenue, Bournemouth. The only motive that he had was that he believed he could get away with it. Elliot had boasted to his friends that he would do it and then come out of jail as a millionaire. On the night that he put his hands around Emily's neck, it appeared that he had seen his girlfriend, an aspiring model, in a picture with two topless men. 
Although he denied his guilt for four weeks of the trial, a jury at Winchester Crown Court found Elliot Turner guilty of murder. He had earlier admitted to perverting the course of justice. Both parents, Lee and Anita, were also found guilty of the same crime, perverting the course of justice. While Elliot was convicted by a majority of 10 to 2, he was to be sentenced on a further date after nine hours of deliberation by the jury. Simon Jones, Crown Advocate for the Crown Prosecution Service of Wessex, he said, Emily Longley was a popular and beautiful young girl who enjoyed life, like any other teenager. Mark and Caroline Longley spoke after the verdict to pay tribute to their child. Emily's mother said, You have lost a part of you. Something has gone and you just have to learn to live without them. As a parent, all you want to do is to protect your child and we couldn't be there to help her. She basically died alone in that bedroom. We heard what he did to her and then just walked away and left her. Emily's father added, It's a terrible waste of a promising life. The world really was a better place with Emily in it. It really was. What shocked me is a lack of remorse, not just from him, but from his parents as well throughout the trial. We've had to look at them in the court and outside. His mother's eyes caught both of our eyes a lot, and there's never been the slightest hint of remorse. After the court's judgment was passed, Elliot appealed it. His counsel argued that covert means were used in obtaining the evidence that was used against him. The case, however, was dismissed by the judges in the Court of Appeal. A large number of Emily's family were in court, and it took less than five minutes for the Lord Chief Justice to conclude about the dismissal of the appeal. Elliot Turner was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 16 years. His parents were sentenced to 27 months in prison for perverting the course of justice. They had served half of it before they were released. However, Anita Turner, who was born in Indonesia, was at risk of being deported to her home country. Under British law, it is the Home Secretary's duty to deport any non-European foreign national sentenced to 12 months or longer in prison. Emily's father Mark now says that it is the duty of men to tell other men to do right by their spouse or girlfriends. The police didn't really tell us much until the day before the trial began. And then they outlined Elliot Turner's behaviour from the start of the relationship, which was uh, in February to the night he murdered Emily in May. And, and, and then, you know, and I was shocked. I remember sitting in that meeting with the police as they told me this catalogue of behaviour that Elliot Turner had done to Emily in, in such a short space of time. And, and I was deeply shocked. And, you know, and my first reaction was, why did no one do anything? You know, why did no one stop him or rein him in? And, and, and this behavior went from verbal abuse to much more extreme examples of uh, him putting his hand around her throat on a number of occasions and in public. You know, and again, th this action is, it's something people often dismiss, but it's a very aggressive and very dominant action to put your hand around someone who's weaker and smaller than you's throat. Uh, you, you know, you're basically saying, I have the power to kill you now. You know, he told people he was going to kill her. It, it, in the short space of time, it, it had every sign was there, you know, and I, I just, you know, my, my reaction was, why did no one pick this up? He added by saying the grief of losing his daughter was still with him and that that was okay by him, saying, Grief is not a bad thing. I don't want to stop feeling sad that Emily died. Do you think the punishments fit the crimes here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. Remember to hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.